Hola, comadres. Welcome to the 30th episode of Comadreando. I'm your host, Marcy, and today we're joined by an amazing guest, Maria Angeli. I will let her introduce herself. Who are you? Hi, everyone. My name is Maria Angeli. You guys can call me Angie because I know my name is a little, a little bit of a mouthful. I am a speech language pathologist, and today I am super, super excited to be joining all of you. Wait, but let's talk about your other hat. You're also a new mom. Yes, I am. I am. My little one is currently mm-hmm. sleeping. Um, but yes, how- I have been welcomed to the mom club. Oh, how how old is your baby? He is eight months. He uh, turned nine months. months in like a week. Oh my god! So yeah, time flies. I know. I re- I remember you being pregnant. It's crazy. But I feel like time like speeds up now. Yeah, after your it month. does. It definitely does. Um, you blink and they're like one years old. And you're like, what yeah. the hell happened? Um, so I want to tell the comadres how we met. Uh, we used to work at the same school, and I was besties with her sister. We were like teacher besties at the school, and um. Angie was the speech pathologist there. She was working with a lot of my students. Um, so, you know, that's how we connected. And our topic today is speech and milestones. So the reason why the topic came up is I'm often asked by new moms, like Maria and Jelly, and um, other parents, oh, like what is normal in regards to speech development? And I feel like it's an important topic to cover because, um, you know, I want to give other moms things to look out for and um i feel like the earlier you can get help the better okay so she you already told us you're a a speech pathologist so i want to ask you a personal question what made you decide to pursue that career you know it's it's a quite interesting story because it wasn't my first choice um you know i grew up in washington heights which if you don't know is a predominantly Um, Hispanic uh, community. Mm -hmm. So growing up, I had never heard of a speech language pathologist. I didn't know anybody. I've never heard of that field. It wasn't something that, you know, when I got to college, I said, oh yeah, that's what I want to be. I actually majored in psychology. That's what I wanted to do. That's what I had been exposed to. Um, You know, growing up, it's like, if you want to help your community, you're either a doctor, a nurse, or some type of like psychologist. Like that's what helping your people is um so I was in my third year of college you know taking my psychology courses and I kind of just felt burnt out um my personality is more you know I like answers I like concrete answers Mm -hmm. um I like things that are like scientific based and I felt that in psychology um a lot of things were great you know, there's not a real answer to things. It's more of, you know, trial and error. Um, you have different therapy methods. And if it doesn't work, you keep going, you keep going. And I just felt that the lifestyle that I wanted, that wasn't what I was trying to pursue. And I wasn't trying to pursue a PhD in psychology to extend my years. Mm-hmm. It's me. I kind of wanted to be done. So I kind of hit this fork in the road. And I said, what am I going to do? Am I going to throw away my three years of school and start again, which by the way happens to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. They start a major and then they're just kind of like, this isn't for me. So my best friend was in the same boat as me. So we started just looking at different um, careers that we could use a psychology degree in. And then this fancy word, speech language pathologist Mm -hmm. popped up and we started looking into it we took a course linguistic 101 and i loved it um it only required a master's mm-hmm. so this is also a little a little sidebar anybody who's trying to be a speech language pathologist you know you get your bachelor's and you go to you get your master's and you get your license and you can practice amazing so that's how i i kind of stumbled upon the field and i'm just very lucky that i loved it and i still love it and um i'm grateful uh, I want to do a sidebar. When I was doing my master's, I had to take a linguistics class. And I was like, so like my brain, I love like knowing how things work and like the little nuances of things. And I feel like that class was just like it for me. Um, when I took the linguistics class, I went to say college, by the way. So when I took the linguistics class, I see, I was just like, wow, if I don't become a, sp- a special education teacher, I definitely want to be a speech teacher because it was just just learning how the mind works and how 
language is developed and how you can help people develop language in that was like phenomenal to me. So how long have you been uh, doing this? Um, so I'm just four years and a half. Mm-hmm. I'm going to my fifth year in September. Um, so still pretty new. Still consider myself a newbie. All right. So when you started working at, um, you started working in a public school. Yes. Right off, you know, I graduated and I went um, straight into the school system. I, I knew I wanted to work with school age uh, children. So that's exactly what I did. So I want to know uh, what was it like those first early stages of be- being a speech teacher and working with the with the babies? Because they're not babies. You you work from pre-K to fifth or, or just kindergarten to fifth? So three K, you know, we got three years. Okay. Three K to second grade. Um, I have had, you know, a few third graders, um, but mostly I, I work with the little, little ones. They're babies. So what's that like? Well, you know, in the beginning, it's kind of like any other field. When you first graduate and, you know, you start working, you kind of find out that the majority of the things that you were learning in school, you know, you're not really going to use it. Um, it's a different, you know, environment. It's a different world. And you kind of just, you, you, you make the best of it. It was scary. It was scary. And I think the biggest thing that I felt was kind of like imposter syndrome. So I'm like, here I am with like this new degree and, you know, I have to kind of just figure it out. And I'm getting all these questions by parents. And of course, you know, I'm pressuring myself. Like I want to make sure I'm doing the best that I, that I can for my students. Um, but once all of those things, you know, kind of leave and you get your schedule and you get to know your kids, you know, and you, you kind of just dust settles because it's not only just practicing speech, but also like dealing with administration, your coworkers, the team. When you work in a school, it's not you by yourself. It's a team uh-huh. that you that you're working alongside. Once all of that is done, um, you kind of get into the groove of things. And, and that's the same thing that happened to me. Um, after a couple of months, I felt you know, much more comf- comfortable, confident. Um, and I will say I was very, very lucky because my administration is very supportive and so is my district supervisor. Uh-huh. So I, I will say I'm very fortunate. And I worked alongside, at that time, four other speech language pathologists in the school building. So if I ever had any questions, I could go to them. And my teachers were extremely <laughs> supportive <laughs> and knowledgeable. And you know, we'll get into why that's important later on, too. Yeah. So, okay. So walk us through, like you get a new student on your caseload, but what is it like when you first start um, working with them? Uh, For example, like, is there anything that you do to kind of pair with them or like get to know them better? And like, does that tailor your approach with regards to the therapy that you do with your students? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the first thing I get a new student on my case, the first thing you want to do is You always want to read the background on paper of that student. You want to know exactly, you know, what are we going to be working on? What have other teachers said about this student? What has the parent said about this student? What has the communication been? You know, what is the level on paper that they're at? Remember, the level on paper isn't necessarily what you're going to see. Mm -hmm. And I've dealt with both situations where, you know, on paper it says the student has three words. I meet the student. And he's telling me, you know, full-blown stories. Mm -hmm. And the opposite can be true. You know, on paper, it says that he's supposed to be saying these complex sentences, and he has one word. Um, So you want to read the background to kind of get an idea, but you still want to remain objective and, you know, take the student for what they are. Um, But, you know, it's it's good to go in with some type of um, knowledge. So I meet the student. I always, always want to make sure that the student doesn't feel, like, pressured. I don't know Uh if that's the right word, but remember, these are babies, essentially. Now, imagine a three-year-old, a four-year-old, a five-year-old, and here comes this lady that they've never seen before, and I'm taking them out of their classroom. This might be their first experience in a classroom, and now here comes this stranger, and it's taking them away from what, you know, they probably spent two, three weeks um, trying to get comfortable in that environment, and now I'm taking them out. So I always want to present myself in a very, like, fun and, like, friendly manner. There's been times where I go in and pick up the student and they start crying. In that moment, I don't take the student out. Uh-huh. You know, I stay in the classroom. You know, I say, hey, show me around. You know, do you want to play with this? And just try to get them as comfortable as possible. Now, once they do get to my room or if they, 
you know, come the first try. It's usually pretty smooth because the therapy room is kind of like a kid's dream. You know, there's games everywhere and toys and just, you know, I try to make it uh-huh. really, really um, appealing for them. So I, I try to make sure that I engage them in something that they enjoy. And I let them tell me. I don't, you know, I'll give them options and like I'll, I'll show them around like, oh, there's this, there's that. Uh-huh. But I, I, I take their lead. I let them take the lead, excuse me. Um, and those are the first, you know, first session, second session might be depending on how little they are. And we're just going back and forth. I'm trying to get some language out of them, make sure that they know my name, that they understand why they're there. Um, you know, to the best of ability. And depending on what they like, then I know where to take it or what to use and what they're responding to and what they're not responding to. That's awesome. So basically, well, at least when they're babies, you're like getting to know them and figuring out like what makes them tick, like what the things that they're interested in. It's kind of like you're doing like an informal interest survey in a way, right? And then so, yeah, in, in a sense, definitely. And that's not even for the first time, you know, even if, if you notice, for example, that the student really likes Play-Doh, then you know, okay, you know, they like Play-Doh, I'm going to get him com- or her comfortable in this moment. But then later on, if they're really into it, then I can reinforce or reward them for their work with, with that same activity. Awesome. So uh, I love that approach that you try to make the students feel comfortable. I feel that, like that is of the utmost importance. I have dealt with speech therapists that deal with my son that um, they're like, oh, he doesn't want to work with me, blah, blah, blah. Mind you, my kid is like, I mean, you've met him. He's he's very um, outgoing. And if he's comfortable with you, he's just going to like, you know, like hang out with you and do things. So this one, um, I think it was in, it was like in early, not early Head Start. It was like the 3K program. She was like, oh, he doesn't want to work with like me. Like early intervention. Early intervention. Um, it was like one of those socialization programs that he was in. And um, she was like, oh, he doesn't want to work with me, blah, blah, blah. Mind you, every other teacher, every other provider is like, oh my God, he's a joy. So I'm like, what is up with you? So then like I started getting to know him, right? And I was like, yeah, I don't want to work here with my son anymore I think the biggest thing is that as professionals and even as adults there will be times where you don't necessarily click with somebody right and I think that sometimes we dismiss what our kids and and what they feel and how they connect with someone because we feel like we have to force them like no you you have to listen to your teacher you have to you know like your therapist you have to and you know sometimes it's it just you know it could be a personality Mm -hmm. children are very um intuitive yes and sometimes if it's not working it's better just to change it. Yeah, that's that's what I ended up doing. I asked the um, principal if they can put him on a caseload for somebody else. So they were able to yeah. do that, and then he did better. But definitely, I love the I love that approach and the fact that you know we're not a hundred dollar bill. We're not not everybody's gonna like us, and that's okay. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. The way I teach might not work for other students. You know, um, but I do feel sometimes like trying to find a way to work with the person as much as you can and then if like you know Mm -hmm. after you try all these times if it doesn't work then cool you know it's good to move on Mm -hmm. so I wanted to ask you for those new moms um I know your baby's gonna be one in a few months in like three months so about how many words should a child have more or less by the age of one so by 12 months we're usually expecting first words um, 10 to 12 months, that's usually when they say that first, first word. Now, mm-hmm. before that time, you'll hear them say mama, you'll hear them say dada, but that doesn't really have any meaning. They're not, you know, they're not actually calling you mama. Mm-hmm. That's what they're producing. We call that babbling. So by that first birthday is when they'll have that, you know, that first word. I would say by 15 months, which is like a year and a couple of months, we should have about 10, we like to say 10 words, mm-hmm. but by 18 months is usually when they have um, a spurt where their, you know, their vocabulary like really takes off mm-hmm. and it'll jump from like 10 to 15 to like 50. Yeah. Um, but, and I always, 
I'm, you know, very big on this, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't only focus on the words, right? There are so many other layers to communication that we are looking at, right? So it's not to say that just because, you know, little Johnny has, you know, five words that, you know, you should be extremely, extremely concerned. There's, there's other things. Remember, we have expressive language, we have receptive language, we have body language, how they play. These are all, these are all layers to communication that we're looking at. Um, so yes, those, those words are important, but so is, is he responding to his name? If, if, you know, if, if the door closes behind me really loud, is he going to look? You know, these are all things that we're also going to be looking at. Yeah, definitely. Um, in my master's, I did a research on whether, because when Aiden was first diagnosed, they told me just to speak to him in English mm -hmm. to avoid the confusion. And of course, yeah. it wasn't a person of color that told me this. And the person was not Latina. And I didn't really know. So I accepted it. And I was like, cool, whatever you say. Um, but in my research, I did a whole research, um, like, a, what is it? Go, girl. I did a research, like, a, like actually, like, one of my master, like, yeah. we had to do, like, two things to produce, to be able to graduate, and one of them was whether or not, um, if your child has a speech delay, raising them bilingual is going to affect whether or not they speak in the long run, and it actually has an adverse effect. Taking away that home language will actually negatively impact your child because not only that they'll feel ostracized in the house so there was a bunch of research reports i read but what the one that stuck out the most was this um child he was from china and his parents spoke mandarin and he was here in the united states and basically the speech providers he had autism the speech providers told um the parents to only speak to him in english don't speak to him in mandarin um and as he got older once he started speaking he told them that he felt that he didn't belong to the family because he wasn't able to speak mandarin with them and that he didn't understand a lot of the social cues because if you mm -hmm. think about it as bilingual people because you're dominican too um the way we express ourselves in our home language is completely different than how we express ourselves in english you know we have different spanishes like the spanish we use at home is that's another thing i learned in linguistics um the spanish we use at home is not the same spanish that we use academically right so the way we like even showing affection or, or terms of endearment in your home language is completely different than like you know the the foreign language and if your parent was not born here speaking a second language they're not able to give you those nuances of uh socialization via language if you're not teaching them that so yeah like so what's your opinion on that like um should the parents like let's say your child is having a speech delay should they only speak to them in one language or should they speak to them in both? I know that as a bilingual person, we have a, when we're learning English, that we have our home languages, at least my home language is Spanish. We have a long silent period because we're getting that receptive language. And then once we start talking, it's like, you know, it's like it catches up really quickly. So what would you suggest to parents of um, children that are bilingual and if they're having a speech delay? Well, first of all, I want to commend you for doing your research <laughs> um, because it's it's kind of like what you said. Um, a lot of the times when our parents, they do go to the doctor, when they do go to these different professionals, oftentimes whatever it is that that person says, that's what they take. And um, they don't question it, right? Because growing up, that's what we're taught. That if, you know, your doctor or so-and-so who's an expert in this field, if they said that, then if that's what they're um, recommending, that's what you do and you don't question it. Um, so good work. And I, and, and I recommend that to all the moms out there when you're your child's biggest advocate. And if you feel that something is off or, or you just want, you know, a second opinion, you keep pushing, just keep pushing and until you get those answers. Um, so mm -hmm. yes, um, everything said is absolutely correct. Um, the field of speech language pathology is constantly changing and we're constantly, constantly getting new research um, and new information on children that are bilingual. Because when the field first started off, it wasn't for bilingual uh -huh. children, 
right? This was a field that was made for English speakers and delays for English speakers. And now as time has passed and, you know, we have started to include more languages, now is that we're getting more research done on the topic. So yes, back in the days or, you know, a couple of decades ago, it was believed that if your child, if, uh, if your child was in a bilingual home, you should only speak to them in one language to avoid confusion. Now, new research has come out that is absolutely false. Um, I am Dominican. I am a bilingual speech language pathologist. Mm-hmm. And yes, that is the first thing we tell parents. If you speak Spanish at home, even if the child is in a completely monolingual class, continue to speak to your child in the home language mm-hmm. because it is much easier to transfer a concept that the child already has in one language to a second language than to teach that concept from scratch. So, for example, if your child knows that the color red is rojo, right? He looks at the color red and he says, rojo, he can identify that. It's much easier to tell that same child, hey, you know, rojo in English is is red. It's Uh easier to transfer that concept versus completely neglecting everything that the child knows and trying to introduce, you know, this new language and kind of forget about the home language. What I always tell parents is the stronger the home language is, the stronger the second language will be. And yes, there is research that shows that there is a silent period. There's also research that shows that academically, the child may be perceived as not um, achieving like the rest of the class, but there's a catch-up period, right? So it may appear like, oh, you know, the grades are a little bit lower here, but that, you know, it, it balances it out. It's just a phase. Um so to all, you know, my bilingual households, I know there's a lot of you guys don't feel that you can introduce or maintain your home language. Even if your child has a diagnosis, that doesn't affect anything. They are completely capable and able to learn two languages. Mm-hmm. And if your bilingual research also says that, you know, we are very exceptional beings because our brain is just constantly switching between these two languages Mm -hmm. so so you know it's funny i never actually like i listened to the speech pathologist but aiden learned spanish obviously receptively um Mm -hmm. and then he would actually he has this thing when he like when he wants to just listen to a certain language he'll change Mm -hmm. all his favorite cartoons on the tv Mm -hmm. To that language so he'll listen in portuguese he'll listen in mandarin he'll listen in dutch and i'm like what are you listening french and then he knows spanish like he won't speak to me in spanish because he knows i know english but to my grand to my grandmother um he calls her abuelita he's like he will speak to her in spanish and he's very polite he's like abuelita quiero un poquito de jugo por favor and i'm like okay and then his spanish is very like refined it's not like that dominican like oh. okay, spanish <laughs> right <laughs> so <laughs> so it's hilarious um but yeah like the capability of the human mind to learn more than one language at the same time is insane i mean we just have to look at the european model as well like those kids learn more than one more than one um language you three know? languages mm-hmm. at minimum um, yes and i think you know that's something that um specifically for our families that are immigrants i think there's this pressure of you know you need to fit in you need to learn english you need to fit in that they don't value or not that they don't value or just in general the value of their home language in a sense mm-hmm. decreases Right, because there's this pressure that they need to know English, and then we look at our counterparts who you know only know English, and then they're sending their kids to learn Spanish, they're sending their kids to learn Mandarin, right? And we're not. Um, more and more, I see you know Hispanic families where the children don't speak Spanish. That, that um, that's really sad to me. Yes, I also. Something else that's also really important uh, that I feel like maybe people don't know, if if you don't use it, you lose it. That is a thing. Mm-hmm. Meaning if, let's say, your child learned Spanish at home, great, home language, goes to school, learns English. Now, you know, all their friends are speaking English and the little cousins are speaking English. And now when mommy and papi talk to him at home, he's responding in English, right? 
mom and dad are speaking to him in Spanish, but mm-hmm. he's responding to him and to them in English. And he's not using that Spanish or that language, Italian, Mandarin, whatever it may be. Over time, they will lose the ability to speak the language. Wow. Um, I know a lot of even my family members don't say, oh, but like she used to know, you know, Spanish. She used to speak this way. He used to speak this way. Now he's acting like he doesn't know Spanish anymore. No, it's a thing. Oh. If they're no longer using the language, you will see that decline to the point where they don't really have the skill anymore. Yeah. It's like anything else. I always advocate for parents. Like, you know, I I encourage the teaching of like the reading at home, right? But a lot of the parents are like, oh, no, I, I don't have books in English. I'm like, well, lele español. Read to them in Spanish. And, and, you, and that's actually... I'm like, read to them in Spanish. In that language. I'm like, read to them in Spanish. It's like, it's, it's the, it's, it's exactly what you say. Like, it's easier to build if you have already, let's say you have a square peg and you need a round peg. It's easier to turn it into a round peg eventually if you already have that wooden piece there. It's not building it from scratch. Exactly. If you, if you have no wooden piece there, like what, where are you going to get it from? You know? So a lot of the parents, um, the skills, I want to, I want to tell the commanders too. It's like the skills they learn reading in Spanish a lot of those skills are transferable, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, it's easier to teach a child to read in English one, once they have the linguistic basics from their home language. So that's something that I feel like, you know, it should definitely be encouraged at home. Um, so Angie, in like, okay, so 18 months, they have to have about 50 words, more or less, right? I would say, you know, they, we know that they have a spurt around that time. Okay. Um, Like I said, you know, you don't ever want to just get caught up on a concrete number. You want to look at the child as a whole. Mm-hmm. So is, the, is his vocabulary, instead of saying like, oh, does he have 50 words? It's more of like, did you see that increase? Mm-hmm. Did, did he or she go from having, you know, 10 to 15 words to kind of like, hmm kind of been you know he's been picking up on a lot Mm -hmm. of those like you know i think as as you know as parents it's pretty hard to like sit there with a notebook and say okay he says mama Mm -hmm. he says more (laughs) he says no um but you do know as a parent like has has he been picking up does he have more words that's what we want to see yeah so okay so that that in that i mean flipping the coin a what age should there be a concern if there is no language or um yeah, like you don't, like let's say the child is bilingual and they have that silent period, but like what age more or less should parents be concerned if they don't really hear as many words in either language, whether it's the home language or the the, the second language? So that's the thing. Um, and I think that's like the driving point is that there is no set language. There is not a point in period in time where as a speech language pathologist, we're like, okay, he's four. At four, like I said, like you gotta go through that notebook and like, and eh, 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 he doesn't have that. There's a problem. No, you know, as early as nine months, we're looking at skills, right? Mm-hmm. Like I said, you know, at nine months, are they are are they ma 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 ma? Are they repeating those sounds, mm-hmm. right? Or do they have that eye contact? Are they able to localize that that um those sounds, right? Do they turn their head if something's happening? That's as early as nine months. Mm-hmm. Now the most common one right where we see parents really kind of like you know go into overdrive is that 12 month um period because you're expecting that first word yeah you're expecting the, those you know communication skills um, but again it's not set in stone you know at 12 months do they have did they say though that that first word right yeah. Remember, it's a range it's not 12 it's 10 to 15 it mm-hmm. might take a little bit longer right but did, did they have that first word okay are they responding to their name mm-hmm. If you clap, are they imitating you, mm-hmm. right? If you feel that, you know, the child doesn't have those skills, right? Not just not just verbal, mm-hmm. right? Just those other pieces as well, then I would talk, speak to your pediatrician. Yeah. Um, and even if it's just a doubt, right? It doesn't have to be, you know, and, and that's why early intervention is so important. Right, because we know that the earlier that the child gets the help, the better outcome you're you're likely to have. Mm-hmm. And we have many, many children where you know they might start off with a speech delay, they get early intervention, and we're done. Right? They don't yeah. require intervention later on. 
So if you do have that doubt where you feel that your child, you know, has reached, you know, that 15, 18 month um, age and they don't have, you know, a variety of words, you know, let's say those 10, 15 words, they're not responding to their name. They don't have interest in people. They're not imitating, um, you know, your, your actions. Uh, when they're playing, you know, you do peekaboo. Are they are they engaging in that? Are they doing it back to you? Those are the skills that we're looking mm -hmm. at, right? So remember, the child as a whole, not just what they're saying um, verbally. Go to your pediatrician, voice your concerns, get an evaluation. You can get an evaluation. They might say, you know what? You know, we we see we see you, we hear your concerns, but unfortunately, which has happened, unfortunately, your child is not delayed enough. Right, early intervention in the state of New York is provided for the children who need it the most. Right, so your child might have a delay, but it's not significant or severe enough for you to get early intervention. Follow up. Mm -hmm. That's your right as a parent. You get the evaluation. They say we see your concerns. He or she does need a little bit of help, but not enough to get early intervention. You can follow up in six months and say I want another evaluation. Yeah. I'm, I'm still not seeing the progress. Yeah, another thing that yeah. I want to advise the... I'm sorry to interrupt you. Ooh, uh, another thing I want to advise the comadres is that um, I've... So I interviewed another an, a parent um, of a child with special needs. We were talking about routines and safety. So we went through the same experience. Our children regress and lost language, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a big that's red... A big, that's a big one. That's big a big one. red flag, right? So then when I went to, to the spe um, to the pediatrician and I raised my concerns... You're like, oh no, you should wait. So, you know, it took me being a like a like an advocate for my child and like really like stepping in there and be like, yeah, yeah, that doesn't actually happen. Developmentally, um, I know, I know you know obviously, mm -hmm. but like children don't go back once they learn yeah. to speak, right? Right. So that's the same mm -hmm. that's the same with you know, you don't learn to ride a bike and then wake up the next day and now you no longer know how to ride that bike. You know, that's why we say that's a really um, big red flag. So I'm glad you brought that up. If you do, you know, see a language loss or even like some type of skill loss, you do want to bring that up to your pediatrician. You know, if he was responding to his name and now he's no longer doing that, that's a cause for concern. Yeah, even and you know your child best. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say even like uh, I remember the pictures when he was like one years old and he would be looking at the camera and all the photos and then like once the autism settled in it was kind of like he wouldn't look at the camera like I would have to like kind of go around and and search for his eyes to like get him to look at the at the picture so that's another big um red flag right. as well and that's why we say you know yes verbal language is very important but you know that's the point I keep driving in it's the child as a whole it's not only verbal language it's like I said it's those play skills it's that eye contact it's the receptive it's the imitation, right? And of course, language, language itself. Yeah. So just tell us a little bit more about, uh, just like give us some of your stories of being a speech pathologist. Like you can be like very positive or something that really yes. sticks out in your mind. Um, anything like that would be good. I mean, it's unfortunate, but usually the things that stick out in my mind are kind of like, you know, the not so fun stories. Mm -hmm. And I say they're not so fun because I, you can use them as cautionary tales. You know, one thing I'll definitely tell you is day in, day out, my day does never looks the same. Um, <laughs> whether it's because the student is absent or, you know, the student just doesn't feel well, every single day is completely different. And I don't, you know, you can plan as much as you want, but it's not going to go the way that, you know, you think it is. You know, the biggest trend that I've seen now is, um, students, in a sense, not being in the right setting, not being in the right setting, as mm -hmm. in not receiving all of the support that they need. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I bring this up is because I know that, you know, there's going to be, um, well, I hope that this podcast reaches a lot of people and a lot of moms, um, because, you know, I think it's, it's important to say, you know, if your child, if you do feel that your child needs uh, more support and they are receiving that support the ball doesn't stop there you know mm -hmm. your your you advocating doesn't stop there always make sure you know what's happening 
in those sessions, know what the goals are, read those IEPs. For those of you who don't know, an IEP is once you have a school aged child, you know, your child is in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, there's a legal document that says, you know, little Jimmy is entitled to speech therapy. And it says how many times, for how long, what exactly are they working on? Every so often months they say, you know, this is the progress. And the reason that I bring that up is because oftentimes, especially in our communities, we think, oh, that's it. He's going to switch there, but he's going to get better. No, know what's happening. So for me, what, what's been happening is, you know, I often like to call home and I say, hey, you know, this is what's going on here. These are the behaviors that I'm seeing. Is that what you're seeing as well? Right? A lot of the times our children who do have communication difficulties also tend to have behavior. Mm -hmm. And I bring that up because those behaviors have nothing to do with him or her being a bad kid. It has nothing, sometimes it has nothing to do with them being violent or not violent. It has to do with communication and the frustration that comes with not being able to communicate. Mm -hmm. I, you know, just think about it. Think about it yourself. Like imagine having to go the entire day, right? Not being able to to communicate any of your wants and needs, not being able to say, "I don't want that apple." Who said I wanted to be apple? Why mm -hmm. are you bringing me an apple? Mm -hmm. I'm tired today. I don't I don't want to do this. I'm tired. I didn't sleep well. I had a nightmare. Or you know what? That window right there, it's really distracting me. I don't I don't like that the, the sunlight is coming mm -hmm. through. Actually, I don't like the color of the curtain. Mm -hmm. Imagine going through the entire day and nobody's understanding what it is that you're trying to say. And then in a sense, especially in the school, you're being imposed these routines. Yeah. You're being imposed these schedules, right? And oftentimes, I think our parents don't know that you have more options to that. You know, it's not only speech, right? You can get a communication board. You can get a whole communication device. You can get help outside of the school, right? And most importantly, you want to have that communication with the speech therapist in the school or outside of the school for my for my um, younger kids in, in early intervention. So you can carry those skills in the home. A hundred percent, a child receiving therapy is better than no therapy. But that therapy time is usually what? Two times a week for 30 minutes, three times yeah. a week for 30 minutes. That's not enough. <laughs> that practice needs to be carried on into the home. And that's what really makes a difference. And you can tell, yeah. you can 100% tell when a child is working on the same thing across the board, yeah. whether that's in the class, in the therapy room, at home, you can tell it makes a really big difference. Yeah. I, I feel like a lot of parents don't know, like it does, it doesn't stop at the school. And this is regard in regards to therapies as well as education wise, you know, if there's yeah. a goal that we're working on, for example, one of Aiden's goal was like, we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't give him, cause he was, um, what is it? He was naming things. What are you called? Manding, right? Okay. He was manding. He was telling us the, the object, whatever it was that he wanted, but he wasn't, he had the words, but he wasn't speaking in full sentences. Mm -hmm. So if he wanted milk, you'd say milk. Right. Right. So then once we knew that he had all the vocabulary words, the goal that the speech provider came up with was he cannot get anything unless he says the full sentence. And if he doesn't remember reminding him, I want whatever it is that he wants. Oh, please. May I have whatever, please. Right. Once he, once his language started getting more complicated. So it doesn't serve the child. If we are in the school, like, Oh, making sure that they're saying that full sentence, but at home because they're crying and I understand it. Yeah. Because listen, if a child is throwing a tantrum and they're just screaming like whatever it is, the object or the food item or 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 the, the thing that they want to play with and they're on the floor or they're in the street, which is even more stressful for a parent, yes. you know, we forget. Right. And, and then we just want to give in to whatever it is because we want it to stop. Right. And not, and not only that, but just just the nuances of being a, a mom and just kind of like, you know what, today's is not the day. Yeah, you know, it's, it's just not the day. I'm not <laughs> here. <laughs> here you go. No, but seriously, like, uh, you know, once, once, once you come up with a plan with your speech provider and your and your other service providers, it's important to execute that at home and make sure that everybody's on board, not only you. Because another thing, 
my son was going to ba- the babysitter, right? And yes. if I'm implementing a program at home and they're doing it at school, you know, I want the people that take care of him to also be cognizant of that so that they can also implement the same thing. Because, like, it, it has to work. It has to be, like, a global. It can't just be yeah. living just a world of school or whatever So for the child to be successful. So, um, so besides that, like, is there, like, give us, like, one, like, star superstar story of a kid that you worked with my superstar story i would say is <laughs> i always think of him because i'm just so proud of him <laughs> like, i'm just so proud of him so i remember he came in um it was my second year and uh, my administration comes in they they assess him he you know he's uh, an english language learner meaning he speaks his home language and we're gonna now introduce him to English. And, you know, they assess him and they're like, we need to take a look at him. You know, we're having trouble assessing his home language. And I'm like, okay. So I'm doing my assessment, I'm doing my assessment. And I was, you know, I, I, I came to the same conclusion that they did, which is kind of like, we don't know what his home language is, mm-hmm. right? So at this point, the team is thinking that the student speaks an indigenous language, right? In a, an indigenous language, Mexico or something, right? We don't know. <laughs> no, like they just, you know, depending on where you know, our, especially in Washington Heights, you know, we have so many different families that immigrate from different countries. So at this point, we're just kind of like, he has, you know, a language that we're just not familiar with, and we need to go home and figure out. So I called the mom and I was like, hey, you know, what does you know little Peter speak at home? And she's like, Spanish. <laughs> I'm like, no, like, what do you mean he speaks Spanish? Like, he's being classified as a student who speaks an indigenous language. And she's like, no, he speaks Spanish. We speak Spanish. That is the only language that he knows. Long story short, he was so language impaired that he was trying to communicate in Spanish, but it wasn't translating. It was literally jibber jabber. It was the equivalent of him saying, that was his language. But he was so confident when he said that, that it made us believe that mm. it, it was indeed a language and it was an indigenous language. And we were just the ones not equipped um, to identify that language. So, you know, we started off slow with him. Um, pictures, picture boards, picture communication boards, and building up that vocabulary to the point where now my little star student <laughs> is speaking in sentences oh my God. in English, sentences in Spanish, and the same recommendation that we were talking about in the beginning of, of, of the segment. You know, I told mom, speak to him in Spanish. Don't worry about the English. You know Spanish. That is what you guys speak at home. Speak to him in Spanish. The English part, we'll figure that out. That's mm-hmm. our job. That's not your job. And he is fluent in both Spanish, in, in both Spanish and English. Yes, there is like, he, and and he'll tell me. Like I remember, actually, like two three days ago, we were playing a game at the end of the session. Um, it was Zingo, and I have bilingual Zingo, obviously, like English and Spanish. Game. Yeah. And it was like the last two minutes of the session. I'm like, all right, let's pick a a, a quick round. What do you want, English or Spanish? He's like, Espanol. I was like, all right, cool. And then we were playing the game, and he's just kind of like, oh, you know, naming all the different um pictures in spanish and it was that like just strictly spanish oh my god so that's my that's my little fun student oh my god i love that I love all my students. Look at me <laughs> <laughs> um so another thing i recommend to parents is like uh kind of like what we do in the classroom like labeling things in the house mm-hmm. especially if like whatever the home language is like creating labels for things all throughout the house and making sure like especially when they're babies like really like using proper language and like naming things and pointing yeah. to it so that they can see yeah i think it's just like you know human nature you know when, when the kids are so small they're so cute you know we call mm-hmm. everything itty so it's like the doggy the kitty mm-hmm. the the you know the, the ducky um so you know we want to make sure that once we are trying to build that vocabulary we start naming things for what they are um so that they you know they understand that um i had a, I had so a kid that used to call in kindergarten so he came and he was like I was like, so what is this? He's like, es un guau guau. I'm like, es un perro. That's so common. <laughs> that is so common. It's like, no, you know, you have to say it's a dog. Not even a doggy. It's a dog. Um, just so that they could build that um, 
that that vocabulary another thing i tell you know my parents is going back to what we were saying that you know sometimes it's hard you know when you have a goal and it's like oh you know like say the Mm -hmm. whole sentence um you want to make sure just just find those opportunities it doesn't have to be an all-day thing it's like if, if in that moment you do it once once is better than none yes you know what i'm saying there's that another really big thing that i tell um parents is just talk to them that's the that's the number one thing so that's the biggest thing um i feel like a lot of the times when parents are getting advice from either doctors or even teachers they get these advice you know which is totally valid and it works right you know Uh reading to your child every night you know um doing these activities with them um all of that works yes but as we know you know especially now we have a much much higher percentage of working moms than what we did you know 10 Mm -hmm. 20 30 years ago so sometimes you just don't have the time so my biggest thing is always just talk to them right so they they look at me and they're like what do you mean talk to them like why what is there to talk to a two-year-old about like he's not going to talk to me you know Mm -hmm. about the weather and what I do and I do this with my son as well is I just talk to him about whatever it is that I'm doing so yes, I am the crazy lady in the supermarket with my kids <laughs> saying, "Oh look, they don't have pasta. Hmm, it's okay if we don't have pasta. Let's try to pick this up instead." Aww. Hmm, just simple things like that. You know, I'm changing his diaper. I'm like, "Oh, we're gonna change your diaper now." Oh wow, oh wow. That's all that <laughs> is. Just describe what you're doing. If you see that you're trying to cook dinner and your kid is crying because they want to be next to you, let them be next to you, and then tell them. We're making chicken. Look, I'm cutting the chicken. Mm-hmm. I'm getting onions. Mm, onions. Oh, wow. They, there's, you know, makes my eyes burn. Mm-hmm. That's all that is. Because believe it or not, it, as cliche as it sounds, they are like little sponges and they're absorbing all of that language. Yes. And the more you model, the better. Right? So instead of saying, oh, you want cheche? Say, tu quiero leche? Would you like some milk? Mm-hmm. And they may be looking at you like, and then you you answer yourself, yes, I want milk. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, don't be afraid to do that because that's all it is. Yeah. And if that's what you have time for, that is enough. One of the things that um, one of the speech providers that was working with Aiden when he was little, um, he used to tell Aiden, he used to look at him like dead in the eye. And he was like two years old. And he'd be like, use your words. And he would start talking <laughs> every time. That and then um, they told me to get this app on the i on the iPod. It was like a I talk flashcard app. I don't even know if it exists anymore, but it's literally flashcards on like different kind of categories to increase vocabulary yeah. in kids. And then you could switch it to Spanish or English. I think even French and other languages as well. Um, that and then um, the alpha books. I know they don't make them anymore. It was like this little box of books, and it was like A, and it would have like five pages with different things with like things that started with A like A to Z and right. it was like a box like this big but um yeah like those kind of things like even if you have to resort to like using a flashcard app on your phone if you can't talk to your kid just make sure that the flashcard app is actually speaking and not just like showing the picture right. uh-huh so the the, the whole inter I did like an intervention so I was doing the flashcard app I would like make it read it to him twice I would make him repeat it and then I would we would repeat it together at the end so you know it doesn't have to be so clinical it can be more relaxed, but definitely speaking to your children is very important. Yeah. But um, besides that, um, I want to end the podcast how I always end it. Um, I want to thank you, Maria Angeli, for coming on, Angie. Um, and as always, comadres, you can follow me at Comadreando Pod on IG or Angie at, if you want to drop me handle, you can. <laughs> it's Maria Angeli X. So it's my name, a little X at the end. <laughs> okay, on IG. And if you have any questions or if you want me to bring Angie back, if you have any questions for her, make sure to send me a comadregram at comadreando at esethenetwork.com or slide up into my DMs. All right, thank you for spending time this evening with your comadres. Have a, an amazing Sunday. Bye, everyone. Thank you.